hurtful, is cruel, is, is, is inhuman, but it is the only decision that they can live with. The decision to reject people whose fear and need yes. will crack open the little, however scarred and divided community that they've got for themselves. Uh, Agnes says at the breakfast table in Act 3, just make a decision, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, invite the disease in if you think you can cope with it. The, the disease, disease of full consciousness, of course. Yes. And they can't. It's a very interesting dialogue that's going on between some of the major, some of your major playwrights of this century are saying you have to have a world to escape into, you have to have an illusion, particularly Williams, but also you see it in O'Neill, to some extent you see it in Arthur Miller now and then, and, and you and, and then the other side of Miller and so on are saying, no, that is the worst thing you can have. And, and it, 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 that, it, it, it enlarges itself onto the American stage, doesn't it? Because the American dream is precisely that writ large. I don't mean not only the play, mm -hmm. the idea of the American dream. Uh, and that's, that's a dialogue on which you've taken, on the one side of which you've taken a very firm stand. But I wonder whether Tennessee is that far away. Some of Tennessee's characters are destroyed because they will not conform. Uh, they, they're forced into, in, into insane asylums. They're, they're forced into suicide mm. because they are not living the way they're supposed to. So yeah, I, but Williams is often saying that the illusion gives you a certain contentment and happiness, which stri stripped of which you've had it. It seems to me you're saying the illusion is giving you nothing in the end, stripped of which you might have something. There's a difference between um, the illusions about the way reality is and, and the past has been and the illusions with which you live your life. In, in, in a lot of Tennessee's plays, take Streetcar, for example, mm -hmm. Blanche's illusions are totally false, false, false memory, uh, clinging on to something that never was. That's, that, that, that's different. It's a slight different matter. His, his characters, when they are filled with illusion, it's false illusion, a, a different kind of false illusion. It's, it's falsity. It's falsity, but on the other hand, Blanche has a life in that falsity. When the illusion is ripped away, she has no life. It seems to me the difference is that you're saying, in many of your plays, that there is no life in the illusion. Ripped of the illusion, there is a life. And I do see a difference. Maybe I'm pressing it too hard. It is, it's, 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 it's an enormously subtle one, and I'm sure you do see it. Uh, but um, your, your major point is correct. Yes, I, I seem to be harping than a good deal more of my fellow playwrights do on the uh, removal of illusion. Edward Albee still lives in New York, though he moved from Greenwich Village to a converted cheese warehouse in the Tribeca district 20 years ago. He owns another house in Long Island, where he's established a foundation for young artists. And he spends part of the year in Texas, where he teaches a drama course at the University of Houston. It can be awfully subtle. Yeah. And, it can, and it can do things, just change our whole sense of reality in, in, in a second. Orbis' concern to foster new talent emerged early in his career. Edward Orbis did something that will make him a saint forever in terms of playwrights. Uh, Virginia Woolf had a cast of four in one set and was an extraordinary international success, probably the last international blockbuster. And uh, I think it earned its money back every week. It earned its initial investment back. It, was, it, it really was it, it made it, it was a producer's dream. What Albee did with that money was he leased a theater on Van Damme Street, uh, and it was called the Bar Wilder Albee Workshop. And from 1963 to 1969, for six months of the year, every weekend for four or five performances, a new play was produced, not just given a reading, but produced. And I think that every playwright who uh, was alive then passed through that theater. And what Edward did at that time was in a sense invent what is in America called the off-off-Broadway movement and in England uh, is the fringe. As well as John Guare, the Bar Wilder Orby workshop gave a start to writers as diverse as Terence McNally and Sam Shepard. 
Orby told us how he starts writing a play. I have the awareness that there is a play going on in my head. Something clicks and says, Edward, there's a play that you're thinking about. I start getting a very, very hazy sense of uh, who the characters are. Everything's very much out of focus and in a heavy mist and some sense of why they're all together. I keep a play in my head and think about these things and let it come back into focus for a long time, six months, four years sometimes. Finally, it starts really coming into focus and I have some sense of who the characters are. I have some sense of what they want to do or what they don't want to do, at least why, why they're there and why I plan to make a play of them. Are you writing anything at this time? No, 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 no. I've learned writing something down gets it completely out of my head and I lose contact with it. So, no, I don't write anything down. I make no notes, no, no precy, nothing. <clears throat> so I will take my characters and improvise dialogue for them for an hour or so. And if I know them very well, they, they can be in any scene I want to put them in. And I can trust them to be in my play. And then I start writing. When I start writing something down, I have no idea what the first three lines of dialogue are going to be. I have some vague sense, this is all conscious, some vague sense of the destination. I, don't have, I have not made outlines of what happens in Act One and what happens in Act Two or any, any of that stuff. I sort of filter it from what I have decided in my head, guiding it with my craft onto the page. That's as close as I can describe it. It's, it's a kind of translation from the unconscious to the conscious to the page. Do you have a sense of ending when you start? Don't I have a price. vague sense, yes, of where everything is going. Mm. Uh, I usually find that I am at the ending a few pages before I think I'm going to be. But uh, no, uh, otherwise writing would just be uh, typing and that's, and that's fairly boring. You have sometimes spoken about the relationship between dialogue and music, that you have mentioned a speech being like an aria. In what way do you think that uh, the dialogue you're writing has musical uh, analogies? Uh, I learned, mostly I think from uh, Chekhov and from Beckett, that the precision of listening, since a play is made up of sound and silence, those durations and, and the value of, of, of those durations is enormously important in a play. When I'm writing a play, <clears throat> I see it and hear it in front of me as a performed piece on stage, not, not in some kind of limbo, but as a performed piece on stage by actors. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting in the audience listening to the dialogue. Uh, some of it's loud, some of it's soft, some of it's fast, some of it's slow. It's my responsibility to put down very precisely what I hear, to notate very much the way a composer hears uh, duration and he hears uh, loud and soft, fast and slow. A composer hears those things and notates them, quarter notes, half notes, dotted eighth notes. Uh, <clears throat> I do very much the same thing with punctuation. Is it possible though, to compare punctuation in uh, words with the far more precise it would seem to me, but let's discuss this, uh, punctuation and directions that be, can be given by a composer in notes. It seems to I me that musically... Any, I don't think it is any more precise. Pardon? I don't think it is any more precise. There is well, a, I mean, a, for instance, in, in um, there can be a pause in music, which is a bar long, four mm -hmm. beats. Okay, yes. let's just take this simple mm -hmm. one. Pause music is a bar, four beat. Boop, boop, boop. Now you can put, or Pinter can put, or Beckett can put, pause. Now one man's pause is another man's longer. How long is that pause? It depends on several things and it can be precise. You can put down tiny pause, brief pause, pause, long pause. Now th those are kinds of pauses. And the duration, wait, let me finish. The duration of each of these pauses is determined by a, an earlier tempo set by the psychological tempo of, of the speech. I would still say that, that there's, it's not quite as precise, but let's move on to something else. In an aria, you are Splitting could pauses there. It's, it's very, very close. There is, for example, and uh, I find that actors handle it very nicely, a durational difference between a semicolon and a period. Mm -hmm. Once an actor knows that, there's no problem. Nobody's denying that great writing has got a musical component, and I'm certainly not denying that. I'm just intrigued by this analogy. And one more before we move on. Inevitably, your plays will be performed by different groups of people decades later. So uh, why should it be, as it were, uh, 
a piece that should be done the same every time? Uh, well, of course, I don't care what anybody does as long as they end up doing exactly what I've intended, which is fine. And there are many, there are many, many ways of getting uh, at the intention. There's, there's a fine line between uh, free interpretation and distortion. And the one, the one thing you try to be careful about is that the actor is not distorting but is interpreting. There are many ways of, of get, getting at the same destination. Um, I've also found that the further away actors get in rehearsal from what I had seen and heard, the greater difficulty they have in becoming the character. So what I'm doing is, is not trying to uh, hamstring them in any way. I'm not trying to tie them so they, can, they, can't, they can't freely interpret. I'm trying to give them sensible guidelines. That's one of the reasons I like to direct my own plays uh, uh, before anybody else has, to put down on the stage what I heard and what I saw uh, while I was writing, writing the play. In the second part of Three Tall Women, you have three women at different ages playing the one woman. You have a woman in, let's say, late like 20s, a woman in around 50s, and the 90-year-old. Mm -hmm. What possibility did it give you dramatically, this, these three people playing the one person? Well, it's a dramatist who gave me the opportunity of, of examining a, a woman uh, at three ages without doing it in narrative. It, had en it enabled me to, r rather than one, the one woman talking about her past, I, c I could see her as a younger age. It, it, dramatically, it gave me an enormous amount of latitude. I have children. We have one. We have a boy. Yes, we do. I have a son. While the old woman lies comatose in bed, the three characters are invisible to the silent son who comes to visit her. Get out of my house! Stop it! Is, is there him? I said get out of my house! Oh, do be quiet now. Let him alone. He's come to see me. That's it. Do your duty. My goodness. How nice. How handsome. How very... You wouldn't say that if you knew. He came back, let him alone. He's so young. Yes. This is how he looked when he went away. He took his life. One bag went off. No. You wore that coat the day you left. I thought I told you to get a haircut. Yes, he did. He wore that coat. I'm leaving, he said. Took one bag. And his life. He went away from me? Why? Maybe you changed. They say you changed. <laughs> I haven't noticed. He comes back. He comes back to me. I let him. Sure, we have a heart attack and they tell him. <clears throat> he comes back. Twenty plus years, it's a long enough sulk. On both sides. He didn't come back when his father died. Of course not. Throughout your plays, children occur a lot of times, particularly different sorts of sons. Why do you think you keep coming back to this son who is uh, in whatever form invented, dead, mutilated, or silent. I dare say all this must stem, though. I, it, it leads to an area that I think is footless to talk about uh, 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 with, with a writer. It obviously all stems back to some great injury to me uh, being abandoned by my natural parents and, and, and feeling isolated uh, and alone in my adoptive family. It, it all probably stems from that. I imagine so. But when you were a boy, a child, did you feel what you've just said, or is this retrospective? Oh, I suppose, though I wasn't aware of it at the time, I must have felt uh, an enormous loss of, of, of uh, not knowing my natural parents. I must have. Did you ever try to, to get to know them? I suppose I didn't care, ultimately. I used to care.